We are indeed live and uh, happy Black History Month, baby queen. How are you? History Month, I'm good, celebrating. Celebrating and uh, talking to uh, my brother, brother, Dr. Guthrie. Uh, today, we're also uh, commemorating uh, El Haj, Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X. So um, I don't know. Like I said, this always feels like the holidays to me, and, and it is. And and I wish for everyone to um, to feel that way when we can celebrate all of us, everyone, um, and and all of those great individuals who have contributed um, to making what we know of uh, the good of America. Um, and, and so I know many may disagree, but uh, that brother, that elder, peace be upon him, Malcolm X, um, contributed some good things um, and um, I'm honored to say that his his teachings, his life had a great influence on my life and how I lead my life today. Um, so I'm happy about that. What about you? I agree. I think he is, um, he's one of those figures that reminds us of, I think, the complicated history we have when it comes to judging our historical figures uh, with so many of the good things that he contributed that gets masked behind the, the rhetoric of him as a, a radical or troublemaker or all of those things compared to uh, someone like, well, well, who we're talking about tonight with uh, Abraham Lincoln, who is cast as a, a national hero and uh, Honest Abe and those representations, who was also a very complicated person in his own way. So uh, I'm happy to celebrate uh, Brother Malcolm. Um, I'm happy to celebrate Black History Month uh, this month and, and just be reminded that it is not a 28-day celebration. It's a 365-day celebration. Absolutely. And it's for all of us, so. Absolutely. Um, there is no way. It would take us 28 days just to do an intro into uh, what people of African descent have uh, contributed um, to this uh land that we know as as america or the united states of america i'm calling tonight's topic a hot topic uh, because to dr green who has been with us before and and um i really appreciate his wisdom and his humor um his passion and his courage um, to to present on topics like this. So uh, to me this evening, when we talk about Lincoln and, and the uh, Compensated Emancipation Act of 1862 and um, $300 per enslaved individual and so we did the math and so today three hundred dollars would be worth eight thousand two hundred fifty five dollars and eighty eight cents and um when i think about that and the plantation that my mother's people were on in south mm -hmm. carolina um that individual prided himself on having one of the largest plantations. Um, I have a photo of over 300 enslaved individuals. So that 
300 times 300. Anyway, <laughs> um, I it, it blows my mind um, that we're talking about the sale of humans. Mm -hmm. um, a bitter part of our history, but nevertheless, we need these spaces to gather together and to become enlightened, informed, and educated, and to heal, and um, and to process the thought of it. Um, so, still, I'm very happy to be here this evening. So, with that being said, please. Uh, bring on, uh, introduce our guest presenter who is no stranger uh, to this platform and I'll see you on the other side. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you as always for joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce a returning guest to our program, uh, Dr. Michael Green. Dr. Green is an associate professor of history in UNLV's Department of History. He earned his BA and master's degree at UNLV and his PhD at Columbia University. He teaches courses on 19th century America and on Nevada and Las Vegas for the History Department and the Honors College. His books on the Civil War era are Freedom, Union, and Power, Lincoln and His Party During the Civil War from Fordham University Press in 2004. Politics in America in Crisis, the Coming of the Civil War, Lincoln and the Election of 1860, and most recently, Lincoln and Native American, Southern Illinois University Press in 2021. He has published several, several books on Nevada, including his college level textbook, Nevada, a, a History of the Silver State in 2015. Welcome, Dr. Green. I'm going to start showing your uh, presentation and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And I'm glad to be back. I had a great time visiting with you all before. It's an honor to be involved in this program. And I will add to that, I would like to uh, make a land acknowledgement that I am on the land of the Southern Paiute people. And of course, many of you who are looking at this are on the land that belong to various indigenous peoples of Arizona. Uh, trivially, uh, the place where I am was part of Arizona territory before it was part of Nevada. Uh, that's not the subject tonight, although Nevada actually became a state during the Civil War and Arizona became a territory. We're going to be talking about Lincoln, the enslaved and the Compensated Emancipation Act of 1862. And I'm grateful to those involved in this program because it required me to do a little extra digging, and I learned a good bit preparing for this. So let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about some of the themes and issues of the evening. And the first one, that the Civil War created a profound transformation. In 1861, Congress passed and sent to the states a proposed 13th Amendment. This amendment would have protected slavery in the Constitution. And less than four years later, Congress passed the 13th Amendment that we now know, which ended slavery. This tells you that it was a very revolutionary time. As for the actions of the enslaved, there's uh, something in my line of work in history called the self-emancipation thesis that African slaves or African-American enslaved people were the ones who caused their own emancipation. I think there is a lot of truth to that. At the same time, it helped when there were people in power who were sympathetic to their situation. And I'm kind of stealing from the book title in that Lincoln and his fellow Republicans sought to save the Union and expand freedom. They believed strongly that slavery was an evil institution. But as I note here, they would do what was necessary to have the power to do these actions. And while they agreed on the ends, they didn't always agree on the means. Uh, to put it another way, Lincoln once told Senator Charles Sumner, uh, I would say the only real abolitionist in the U.S. Senate, you are six weeks ahead of me. And Sumner said that I can wait six weeks. Well, sometimes Sumner chewed him out and sometimes Lincoln deserved it. 
Let's go to the next slide. Now, I think we know the story pretty well that in 1860, Lincoln was elected president. And even before he took office, seven southern states seceded from the Union. After the firing on Fort Sumter, four more southern states seceded. And you can see that the Lower South acted before April 12, 1861, and then you see the Upper South taking action. Now, there's been a lot of talk over the years, oh, it was for states' rights, oh, it was to protect the rights of Southerners to have their local institutions. A historian edited a volume on the secession winter and found that in only 100% of the legislative debates secession ordinances and newspaper editorials, in only 100% of them, they all said their goal was to protect the institution of slavery. And after the creation of the Confederate States of America, its vice president, Alexander Stevens of Georgia, made a speech calling slavery the cornerstone of this new country and viewing it as the cornerstone of the United States. So I hope there is no doubt about what the South was fighting for. Let's go to the next slide and get to know a little bit about Lincoln before he took office. Now, Lincoln, as we know, was born February 12, 1809 in Kentucky. And at an early age, uh, when he was in his late teens and then early 20s, he went to New Orleans and he did see some enslaved people. And in Kentucky, there is reason to believe when he was a little boy, he also would have seen enslaved people, both Kentucky and Louisiana being slave states. He later said that what he saw in New Orleans really stuck in his craw. How much it stuck is hard to say. We know that Lincoln opposed slavery as an institution, but was not noisy about it, in part because politically it was not that wise for him to be that noisy about it. But as an example of this, when he was a legislator in Illinois in 1838, there was a resolution passed condemning abolitionists. And he refused to go along and said that you must condemn the others too. And he was one of only six members of the legislature who would not vote for that bill. Later, he did not choose to join the Free Soil Party when it broke from the Democrats and the Whigs. And he stayed in the Whig Party a pretty long time even after the Republican Party had begun to gestate in the wake of the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which was introduced by another Illinoisan, Stephen Douglas, who's pictured there on the far right side of the screen. Douglas introduced this bill to repeal the Missouri Compromise prohibition on slavery north of 36 degrees 30 minutes or the southern border of Missouri. And his argument was in favor of what was called popular sovereignty allowing the people of a territory to vote on enslavement. Or, as I like to say in more cynical moments, the American democratic ideal taken to its illogical conclusion, which is that we should be able to vote on whether to enslave people, but the people to be enslaved don't get a vote. Well, this broke up the Whig Party and Democratic Party in creating the new Republican Party. Lincoln joined it in 1855, and he made clear even before that that he opposed what Douglas was doing. And later, he and Douglas debated when Lincoln challenged him for the Senate in 1858. And one of his lines was that Douglas would blow out the moral lights all around us by allowing slavery to grow. At the same time, Lincoln did not come out in favor of racial equality. This was partly political. It was partly common at the time we certainly shouldn't condone it. At the same time, we have to watch our terms. If you had said to Lincoln, you are a racist, he would not have known what you meant because the word and the idea really didn't exist then, much as it may seem strange to believe that. Now, a couple of other points about Lincoln. One of them is that he was a lawyer and a good one. And as a lawyer, he represented both fugitive slaves and masters seeking to re-enslave them. He took what cases came into the office if he thought they were good cases, and he won some and he lost some. It's also interesting to ponder the role of his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln. Mary Lincoln had been 
close to Henry Clay when she was a child, and Clay was Lincoln's hero politically. Clay had believed that slavery was bad, but he didn't think there was much they could do about it. And Clay ended up helping to form the American Colonization Society, which proposed that freed black people would go to Africa, which is, of course, a grievous insult to people who are in the United States and rightfully believe themselves that they were Americans at this point, and not just newcomers. Lincoln thought this was a solution, a possible solution. He stuck to it far longer than he should have. But there's also evidence to suggest that he stuck with certain things in the hopes of driving other people to take the right position. In any case, as Kara said, he was complicated. Let's go to the next slide. When Lincoln took office, the Civil War had not yet technically begun, if you view the firing on Fort Sumter as the opening bell, it would come a little over a month into his term. And at that point, the 11 Confederate states were hoping to attract what were called the border states, the ones with diagonal lines in this map, Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, and Maryland. You see West Virginia there. West Virginia was actually Western Virginia at the beginning of the Civil War, and in one of the oddities of the war, seceded from Virginia. It was a Unionist area. But Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware in particular were key things for Lincoln. For one thing, Maryland was the border for Washington, D.C., with Virginia now trying to defeat Washington, D.C. And Lincoln believed it was important to protect the nation's capital. At one point, he was asked about his views on enslavement, and he said, I would like to have God on my side, but I need Kentucky. And Kentucky, in fact, tried to be neutral during the war at various points. And Lincoln had to adapt his policies to what would keep the border states in the Union. Furthermore, you would have what you call the lower north. Southern Illinois was not that much different from Missouri and Kentucky. No enslavement, but certainly. Uh, it could have gone there if the rest of the state had not opposed it, and there had not been federal law against it. So that's important to bear in mind in terms of what Lincoln and the Union government would do in response to slavery, and what they ultimately did do. So let's go to the next slide. Presidents can sometimes lead us but there's a line attributed to Gandhi where he said, I must catch up with my people because I am their leader. After the war began, enslaved people began coming into Union lines. In addition, there were military leaders who opposed enslavement. Now, on the left was someone who, in fact, was once the territorial governor of Arizona and wandered around my state a bit as well, John C. Fremont. Fremont was the commander in Missouri, and at one point issued his own Emancipation Proclamation there in the late summer of 1861. Lincoln tried to get him to rescind it. Again, his concern being, and I think he was right, that the leaders of Missouri would have switched to the Confederacy if emancipation had become a policy that they had to follow. And Fremont wouldn't do it, and Lincoln eventually had to remove him as commander. Uh, by the way, for the record, Fremont has the distinction of being one of the few generals Lincoln fired twice. The second time was for military incompetence. Now, the fellow on the right was Benjamin Franklin Butler, a Massachusetts Democrat who had voted for the pro-slavery presidential candidate in 1860. But once the war began and he volunteered and he got to be a general through the state militia, he was totally committed to the Union. And he was in command in a part of Virginia when enslaved people become, began coming into his lines. And Butler, in 1861, faced a conundrum. What do I do about this? And he came up with an idea that on the one hand is brilliant, on the other hand is really insulting, but if there's a third hand, it's also ultimately beneficial to the enslaved. 
under the laws of war, you could seize the possessions of your enemy. It was called contraband of war. If you happen to defeat your enemy and your enemy left behind food and clothing and other, say, ammunition, you could seize it. And Butler reasoned they want to claim that they have the right to enslave people as property. Therefore, I am calling them contraband of war. And therefore, they are not to be returned. Well, this was a controversial policy. Notably, Lincoln did nothing against it. He allowed what Butler did to stand. And this is a sign as well that he is committed to defeating the Confederacy and its pro-slavery policies. How far will he go, though, to end enslavement? Well, let's consider the next slide. Fremont and Butler ended up belonging to a group referred to as radical Republicans. Now, Frederick Douglass is in this slide, and Douglass was, I would say, the most radical Republican, and at the same time, he was the one without office. Uh, Douglass was, as we well know, a great orator, an editor, an abolitionist, and he was there to remind Lincoln of what he should do. And for the record, he would say that he didn't always agree with Lincoln, but Lincoln always treated him with respect and listened to him. Fremont's in the photo, and he had long been anti-slavery. On the far left side there, in the upper part, was Edwin Stanton, who became Lincoln's Secretary of War in early 1862. He, too, had been a pro-slavery Democrat, and the war changed him, and he came over to the other side. Now, in the bottom row, Senator Charles Sumner is in the lower right, and I've already talked about him. In the lower left, Thaddeus Stevens was the power for the Republican Party in the House of Representatives. He opposed slavery, and he also was an old deal maker. Uh, there's a tendency to view Stevens as this totally principled, unyielding, rigid fellow, and he certainly could be. But he was also a shrewd political operator who could cut a deal when he had to. In the middle there is the one member of Lincoln's cabinet who you would have called a radical Republican from the outset, Salmon Chase, who by the Civil War had been a governor in Ohio and a U.S. senator. He had been a major figure in fighting slavery as an attorney. He had helped to free many people who were called fugitive slaves, whether or not they actually were. And while he and Lincoln did not get along famously, Chase could be a difficult fellow, at the same time, Lincoln and Chase eventually came to an understanding of each other on this issue. So there are people pressuring Lincoln from what we would now call his left. There are also conservative Republicans and moderate Republicans, and they don't necessarily believe the radical Republicans are right. And today, when we think of partisanship, uh, we tend to think that both parties are totally unified on the issues that matter to them. They're really not all the time, and that was certainly true of Lincoln's party in the Civil War. Another note about that, during the Civil War, they weren't the Republican Party. They were the Union Party. They changed their name in hopes of attracting Democrats who supported the war effort. They were successful. Stanton would have been a war Democrat at the outset. But at the same time, a lot of those war Democrats came over to the side of ending enslavement. Let's go to the next slide, because we're going to talk about Lincoln being, uh, shall we say, shrewd or trying something a little different. And I love that photo of him because there's a little smirk that tells you he's up to something, and he was here. And this was a plan Lincoln had for having compensated emancipation in the state of Delaware. And he had tried to avoid the issue as much as possible in his first year as president. But late in the year, Lincoln drafted a bill himself for the Delaware legislature that would have provided for the gradual compensated emancipation of the enslaved people in Delaware. Delaware had fewer than 2,000 slaves by the time the war began, and it was, well, the most loyal of the border states and the one with, the, you might say, the least commitment to enslavement. So Lincoln thought, maybe I can get them to approve some kind of emancipation and get others to go along. 
And in the end, the bill he proposed actually would have continued slavery for another 30 plus years. When he called it gradual compensated emancipation, he meant it. There would be apprenticeships involved. It was not by any means what we would call advanced, except that it was incredibly advanced. No president to that time had ever made such a proposal. No president to that time had dared to take that kind of stand on the issue. And that kind of goes to what motivated the South to secede, knowing that for the first time, there was a president who believed and would say that enslavement was wrong. Well, even this bill was not good enough for the state of Delaware. They wouldn't pass it. Lincoln called for them to pass it in his annual message. They still wouldn't do it, which tells you a great deal, I would say, about the feeling in the border states that mattered so much to Lincoln and the political risks involved. Let's go to the next slide. Because while Lincoln is making this proposal, there is movement toward emancipation in 1862. The fellow on the lower right, David Hunter, was a general who came from Illinois. Lincoln had known him. And when he was in command in South Carolina, he attempted to emancipate the enslaved within his command, and Lincoln told him no. He revoked it. And Lincoln's argument was kind of interesting, and I think it's frankly important. His argument was the military should not do this. This must be a civil matter. It must be the government itself, the legislative and executive branches, not simply a military edict. Yet at the same time, there was an edict that Lincoln and his administration made that spoke volumes, I think. In 1862, the United States, for the first time, recognized the Republic of Haiti. Created in the revolution that ran in the 1790s and 1800s under the leadership of Toussaint L'Overture. And of course, it was a majority black republic. And no previous president would acknowledge it. Lincoln did. Another fellow Illinoisan, Lyman Trumbull, who's in the upper right there, introduced a bill that essentially allowed the confiscation of the enslaved put into law what Butler had done as a general. And Trumbull, in introducing this bill, wound up with Lincoln being a little nervous about this. Lincoln was not sure on legal grounds that he could approve this bill, not because he thought that slavery needed to be protected, but whether it was within the powers of the Constitution. Ultimately, he went along, though he made some very grudging and begrudging noises that irked Trumbull and other moderate and radical Republicans. But again, we are seeing movement in the right direction. So let us get a little more movement going in the right direction and go to the next slide, where we get another major piece of legislation, and the reason we're really gathered here tonight, the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act of 1862. Now, remember that Washington, D.C. is a federal enclave, meaning that the federal government controlled it. They did not have to leave it up to the states. There could be no claim of states' rights. And as early as the 18 teens, there was talk of ending the slave trade in Washington, D.C. There was a congressman from Virginia, John Randolph of Roanoke, himself an enslaver, who supported doing this. Later, a Pennsylvania congressman who was, I would say, close to being an abolitionist, Charles Minor, and he's in the far right of the slide here, he introduced legislation to try to do this. He ultimately failed. It did not pass. But even in the 1820s, there was talk of this and the issue that in the nation's capital, you had the oppressed. It was not the home of the brave. It was the home of the oppressed. People were being trafficked within sight of Capitol Hill. And when Abraham Lincoln served a term in Congress in the late 1840s, he also tried to end this practice and got nowhere. Well, finally, someone would take action. A senator from Massachusetts named Henry Wilson, 
was the guiding force behind what became known as the D.C. Emancipation Act. Henry Wilson was a very interesting character who doesn't get nearly the attention in American history he should get. One of the things that made him interesting is that Henry Wilson was not his given name. He was born Jeremiah Jones Colbath, and essentially he was orphaned, and he still had parents, but they indentured him to a farmer. Uh, he was adopted. He adopted a new name, and he went on to be a success in business and politics. And like Lincoln, he was a thoroughly political animal. He was very good at counting the votes and organizing. He helped found the Free Soil Party. Unlike Lincoln, he left the Whig Party. He joined the Republican Party. At the same time, Wilson dallied with the Know Nothing Party, the anti-immigrant party of the mid-1850s, that Lincoln would have nothing to do with. In any case, Wilson ultimately introduced this bill, as did a representative, Thomas Key, and the bill passed the House and Senate, and it passed by a large majority in the spring of 1862. Now, this bill is not the kind of compensation that it should have been. Essentially, those who enslaved people would receive $300 for each enslaved person who would be emancipated. There was no talk of compensating the enslaved for their time, their labor, their suffering. This was an effort to appease the white power structure, to put it simply. When Congress passed the bill, it went to Lincoln, who would have to sign it, and Lincoln wanted some changes. He wanted the people of Washington, D.C. to vote on the bill, and Congress wouldn't go along. It's kind of interesting today because there's a movement in Washington, D.C. for statehood, and they say, we are like the revolutionaries, taxation without representation. Lincoln, in this case, wants them to vote, which today's people of Washington, D.C. might say, yeah, finally someone giving us a vote. At the same time, Lincoln is kind of taking Douglas's position, let the people vote. And it brings to mind a book title about Lincoln on racial issues, big enough to be inconsistent. Well, another proposal from Lincoln was that it would be implemented gradually. Not, or not quite gradually, but at least there'd be a little delay. And he believed that there should be a little time to get everybody settled on this issue. And according to him, he had been told this by people who I think were, to be blunt, uh, putting one over on him, if Lincoln could have one put over on him, that uh, they had aged enslaved people who would not be able to care for themselves at that time. They were old and infirm, and they wanted to make sure that they were taken care of. Well, taking care of them meant sending them to a plantation in Maryland. In any case, the point of this is Lincoln signed it. And later, there were some changes to it that Lincoln proposed that were implemented. But if you think about it, the federal government set aside a million dollars to compensate enslavers. That's terrible. The result was freedom for the enslaved. They also set aside $100,000 to pay each newly freed enslaved person $100 if they chose to leave the United States and colonize elsewhere. And it's not easy to make an argument in favor of this. I wouldn't even try. I do think what we're seeing here is a kind of two steps forward, one step back approach, knowing that anything that goes the wrong way to use a phrase, if something goes badly, it could go south. If things went south, it was bad for the Union. And in a sense, Lincoln made his deal with the devil. Well, it was signed on April 16th. And in the 
156 years since April 16th has been Emancipation Day in Washington, D.C. Uh, there was a parade. It last, They had the parade for about 35 years. They ran out of money for it. A hundred years later, it came back. And there is today a rule in the nation's capital that workers can make it a private holiday. And there's eventually a movement afoot to make it an official city holiday. And it became one. So, you know, we think of Juneteenth, and that is an important day to celebrate. Washington, D.C. has its own version of it. Let's go to the next slide. Something to think about in this regard. Five months after emancipation was signed for Washington, D.C., Lincoln issued the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation on September 22nd, 1862, saying 100 days from now, if the southern states have not given up, I will order the emancipation of the enslaved people within the Confederacy. Now, Lincoln had actually done a draft of this by July. And in the photo, or I shouldn't say the photo, this is a portrait, it's a photo of a portrait by a man named Francis Carpenter. You see Lincoln there, and he and the rest of the cabinet tend to be looking toward a guy whose left side is visible to you in profile, Secretary of State William Henry Seward. And Seward was Lincoln's closest advisor, and had been considered a radical Republican and ended up being a conservative Republican. At the time, Seward said, I am all in favor of emancipation, but if you just announce this without anything behind it, it's not going to matter. You need a military victory. You need something that will say you're in a position of power to impose this. And Lincoln understood this and agreed with it. Well, on September 17, 1862, the Union and the Confederacy fought the Battle of Antietam. The Union barely won. And as far as Lincoln was concerned, it was not a great victory for the Union, but it was a victory. And he called the cabinet together and he said, I am issuing this. Now, several of the cabinet members were dubious about it, Seward included. But there's an old story of Lincoln having a cabinet meeting, and you can see that he is joined by seven people in the cabinet here. Well, one time he said, let's put it to a vote. All in favor, say aye. And he held his hand up and said aye. And he said, all opposed, say nay. And the other seven raised their hand and said nay. And Lincoln smiled at them and said, the ayes have it. Well, that meant on January 1st, 1863, let's go to the next slide. He issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And it's worth noting, perhaps, that when he signed it, it was New Year's Day. We're going to get to the quote there in a minute. It was New Year's Day, and the president back then would open the White House on New Year's Day and shake hands. And Lincoln's hand, he'd shaken hundreds of people's hands. He was shaky when he tried to sign it, and he put the pen down and said, no, I need to do this where it doesn't look like I'm quavering. And he came back later that day, and he signed it. Now, the very distinguished scholar Richard Hofstadter once said of the Emancipation Proclamation that it had the moral grandeur of a bill of lading. Next, let's go to the next slide. Because that's a bill of lading. It's essentially a cargo statement. And Hofstadter was saying that it was a very legalistic, lawyerly document without Lincoln's literary talent showing. If you think of the Gettysburg Address, the second inaugural address, these are beautifully and brilliantly written. And this document is a legal paper. Well, yes, it is. But that's the point. Lincoln, as a lawyer, knew he had to put it as legalistically as possible. Yes, it would be nice to make a beautiful sweeping statement. And in a way, the proclamation was a beautiful sweeping statement as a proclamation. In the wording of the document, he is very carefully laying out this is where it applies, this is not where it applies, these are the results, etc. He also calls for the African-American troops to join up. 
And his hope had been that African Americans fighting beside white soldiers would help ease the opposition to emancipation that existed in the ranks. It helped in some cases and it didn't in others. But when he issued it, let's go to the next slide, there were celebrations. The enslaved people often couldn't read and they certainly didn't have newspapers and there was definitely not cable news or texting or instant messaging or anything like that. But there was a great grapevine and they knew very well what was coming and they celebrated. Now, if we go to the next slide, yeah, it, it's a great thing to have emancipation. At the same time, it's limited. And you will see on this map, it's a significant proclamation, but there are limits to it. Uh, the map isn't coming up right now, but to explain, there we are. Not every southern state was subject completely to emancipation. You see some mark some different colors there. Uh, there were areas where the Union was in control or they were taking action already, and he didn't include them. The other thing is, if you think about it, oh, the proclamation is emancipating people where Lincoln doesn't have the power to emancipate them. What's he doing in Kentucky and Maryland and Missouri? He's not doing that. He's doing it where, understandably at the time, uh, Confederate loyalists are going to say, Jefferson Davis is our president. We're not paying attention to you. Well, uh, maybe so. But there are a few points to this. One of them is, Lincoln was asked a few times between the preliminary and final proclamations if he would revoke it, if he would change his mind. And he came up with a soundbite. He said, I would not if I could, and I could not if I would. Which on one part meant there was no way he was going back. The other part was that he knew in saying this in the first place, he had set a policy. The Union government going forward would support emancipation. And it is very hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube. It also led, in significance, to another factor. Let's go to the next slide, which was the enrollment of African-American soldiers and, yes, sailors, mostly freed people and from the border states. But we're talking here about nearly 200,000, well, actually more than 200,000 African Americans who served in the military. Uh, let's go to the next slide uh, because I do have to say there's a pretty good movie on it. Uh, it's not completely accurate historically, uh, but it tells a story and it tells the story very well. Let's go to the next slide. Some very important future events. First of all, Lincoln understood that what he had done was issue an executive order as commander-in-chief, and another commander-in-chief could revoke it, to the point that in 1864 he thought he was going to be defeated for re-election, and he believed that if he lost, his opponent would make peace with the South and probably bring back enslavement, or continue it, or support it. He opposed that. and. In 1864, his party's platform called for the passage of a constitutional amendment to end enslavement. Well, during that year, the Senate overwhelmingly passed a 13th Amendment that would have ended the institution of slavery. But it takes two thirds, and in the House, the vote was 93 to 65 in favor. And that's a good majority, but it's not two thirds. And before he was going to begin his second term, Lincoln wanted to make sure that this would be done. And if you have seen the movie Lincoln, you have seen an account of how this happened. It's an account. It's not the complete account. It's not the entirely accurate account. Uh, my wife and I went to see the movie with some friends, and afterward my wife commented it must not have been too bad because he only grunted once. And that was true. There was only one time I audibly groaned or grunted at a scene. Not everything was correct in the movie. 
but at the very least, it conveyed the politics of what was happening. Lincoln and Seward did indeed send in lobbyists to pay off reluctant members of Congress, especially ones who were defeated for re-election or were just leaving office by offering them jobs, and there might have been some money involved, yeah, and getting radical Republicans to quiet down about aspects of the amendment they did not like, that it did not take stronger positions on the rights of African Americans as citizens. Ultimately, it passed, 119 to 56, and that means that if three of the majority had not voted as they did, it would have been defeated. So they came that close. And one of the ways they also did it was by getting some of the opponents of the amendment to stay home. So politics, in a low way, did something very good. Thaddeus Stevens allegedly said that the greatest act in American history, the noblest act, was committed by a noble man through ignoble means. Well, that will lead to Juneteenth, the proclamation in Texas that enslavement was ending, and the 14th and 15th Amendments, which define some of the rights of these newly freed African Americans. And the D.C. Compensated Emancipation Act was a part of this, an important part, a part that set a precedent in a good way for ending enslavement, in a bad way in terms of compensation, it was also the only compensation that passed. And I think we can agree the people it compensated were a lot less deserving than the people who should have been compensated. Anyway, I did not want to talk the whole time because I also wanted to leave time for questions and uh, various riffs if you need me to riff. Uh, anyway, I hope it has been a good presentation for you, and uh, I addressed some questions, and I'm glad to address other questions. All right. Thank you so much. Um, that was absolutely amazing. I um, am struggling a little bit with my nose, so I apologize if I break up during any of these questions, but let me go ahead and start diving in. Um, uh, by the way, the I should note uh, that, before that you start, I, oh, I was just going to say before you start, a warning to everyone watching, a cat may decide to walk across the screen. He's been making noises and I've been trying to get him under control, but he owns the house. <laughs> You're that's okay. We are, <laughs> we are fans here, so that's totally fine. Um, so... One of the things that I, I was reading about was, and you covered it in your uh, your presentation, was the the Delaware experiment. Um, and uh, it, what I found interesting with that, and in comparison to the DC um, uh, Compensated Emancipation Act, was that the focus was still solidly on the um, the pitying of Southern slave owners um, and compensating those slave owners rather than actually on even the lives of the enslaved. Um, so regardless of our, I mean, we acknowledge Lincoln was complicated. All of this was, was very complicated. Uh, but what does this tell us about the nation's grappling with the concept of slavery as an economic versus a moral issue? There is a story I like to tell about the territorial governor of Nevada, James Warren Nye, who was an old New York political apparatchik. I mean, he, he was always involved in various political machines. He was a Republican, and he was anti-slavery. And in the winter of 1860, he bumped into a New York City merchant who started talking about secession, and he said, my business is going. And Nye said, well, let it go. Well, yes, I agree with Nye, let it go. But the institution of slavery was intertwined in the United States in so many ways, socially and culturally, yes, 
politically, yes, but also economically. And there is the one theory that the North and South were competing economically because you had the increasingly industrial North and the agricultural South, when in fact the North was also agricultural and the South was also industrial. They should have been compatible. Well, in certain ways they were too compatible because there were a lot of people in the North who had an economic investment in Southern success, not in the war, but in the success of the institution of slavery. Sadly, there were others in the North who just didn't care either way. You had a Douglas in Illinois saying, I don't care if it's voted up or down, which we did not hear from Lincoln. But at the same time, we know that Lincoln was far less advanced than a lot of other people. And, and it tells us enslavement goes back to our beginnings. Uh, there has been controversy about the 1619 Project. And I have looked at sources over the years, and I am convinced that African enslavement existed here from the moment that Africans arrived on that Dutch ship. And it is an enormous blot on American history that we need to study. We need to try to understand what was happening. And I think we can do this without condoning it. Another point about Lincoln that I think is very interesting. Lincoln had this talent that a lot of people don't have, and it's a useful talent, which is to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And he went so far as to say in a speech one time, if we were Southerners, he was talking to a group of them, if we lived in the South, we'd be like them. That's how they were raised. And that doesn't mean we should condone them, as I say. But understanding how this has happened, how this has gone terribly wrong in so many ways and right at times, uh, I, I think it tells us that this issue has been with us from the beginning and it's with us today. You know, there's an interesting quote um, from 1862 where Lincoln was speaking with, uh, I believe, an abolitionist or an abolitionist group. Um, and he's quoted as saying that he pitied Southerners for having been corrupted by the commercial and social investment in slavery. Um, and what's so interesting about it is that rather than seeking to impress upon the South the error of this corruption, um, he instead is urging abolitionists to, and this is part of the quote, um, to impress on the people the feeling that they should be ready and eager to share largely the pecuniary losses to which the South would be subjected if emancipation should occur. Um, so while he's referring to slavery as the disease of the entire nation, as, as part of that quote as well, it just makes me question what what exactly was he considering the nature of, of that disease? Um, again, it, it kind of seems to boil down to that question of, was it a moral or was it a more economic disease? Um, or, or really why was the argument that uh, we should all be willing to share in compensating those who are on the wrong side, which is what he seems to be saying. And this is one of those ways in which history is an argument without end. We are all complicated. On moral grounds, Lincoln thought slavery was wrong. I do not believe we should argue that point. What was he going to do about it? That's where the argument comes in. And Lincoln did not believe that you got anywhere by demonizing the South, which ab some abolitionists did and some other Republicans were not abolitionists did. And uh, I don't want to sound like Seinfeld and say not that there's anything wrong with that because I don't think there was anything wrong with demonizing. But in terms of where Lincoln thought I can get to the point where we have reunited the country, we have gotten rid of the problem, the disease, if we can do it with the carrot instead of the stick, uh, I'll go even further into 
strangeness and say it's like Mary Poppins saying a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, uh, then maybe we can win them back over. Now, in terms of the enslaved people, who were the ones who deserved the compensation, no question, were they in a position to make that decision? Lincoln's a politician and a good one. And sometimes politicians do things for great reasons and they're terrible actions. And this is one of them. Is it going to get us to emancipation? Is it going to get us closer to ending slavery? If it is, this is the price we pay. Now, how much Lincoln moralized about this, how much he really thought about that, we don't know. One of the reasons we don't know, and a comparison for you, uh, someone who wrote All Men Are Created Equal and Enslaved People, and apparently had children with an enslaved woman, Thomas Jefferson. His papers are more than 50 volumes and they're still going. I can look over, I'm sitting in my home office, at the nine volumes of Lincoln's writings. And we don't know how much he actually wrote and it was destroyed or was lost, whatever. But we don't have on his part a lot of self-reflection where we would say, oh, he, he was struggling with this in this way. We have to make assumptions. Here he comes. I think we're going to get a cat. And, well, he changed his mind. Uh, we're not too sure what all the discussions were. Uh, this is not unusual. Uh, when I was doing research on my dissertation, I was in William Henry Stewart's papers, and he was constantly writing to his closest friend saying, uh, this is so important, I don't want to write it down. I'll talk to you when I see you. Hmm. And I'm sitting there going, because uh, that doesn't help me. And Lincoln doesn't help us in understanding this nearly as much as we'd like. Uh, there was an argument made by a wonderful writer and historian, Lerone Bennett, that it was Lincoln was entirely a white supremacist. And this was all about white people and whiteness. And I think that goes too far. I do think by our definition today, Lincoln's a racist. As I said, though, he wouldn't know what the term was at the time. But he is thinking far more of the meaning of all of this to white Americans than to black Americans. I also think he is thinking about black Americans. So again, it's not simple. I wish it was. I'm going to read a, a quote that actually relates to what you were just sharing. Um, this is a quote from Lincoln, and he says, um, of the South, they think they have a moral and legal right to their slaves. And until very recently, the North had been of the same opinion. For 200 years, the whole country has admitted it and regarded and treated the slaves as property. Now, does the mere fact that the North has come suddenly to a contrary opinion give us the right to take the slaves from their owners without compensation? The Blacks must be freed. Slavery is the bone that we are fighting over. It must be got out of the way to give us permanent peace. And if we have, the, if we have to fight this war till the South is subjugated, then I think we shall be justified in freeing the slaves without compensation. But in any settlement arrived at before they force things to that extremity, is it not right and fair that we should make payment for the slaves? Uh, so I, I had a different question kind of mapped out in, in regards to that, but just from what you were sharing, are we aware, were there people who pushed back on that, push back on that representation that he's making where it is very uh, white centric. It is very focused on the economics of, of the North kind of pacifying the South or compensating the slave owners. Um, and there's not a focus on, on what's really happening with the enslaved, with the black people who he's saying must be freed. Um, were there people who who we have record of who pushed back and told him that you're coming at this wrong or you're not focusing on the right things or, or anything like that? 
we do. Uh, the radical Republicans, some of whom I mentioned, uh, some of them made this clear. Frederick Douglass is an example, certainly. And Douglass was an advocate and a great one. And I think Lincoln gave him his good ear, so to speak. Sumner certainly felt that way. Thaddeus Stevens had advocated breaking up the plantations and giving the land to the formerly enslaved. And Lincoln was not going there necessarily, but there's a lot we don't know. And not just because of what I said about Lincoln's papers. And you mentioned my, my first book, which was my dissertation, and I found the examples I've cited, the people I've cited. What I also found is that they're too busy fighting the war and legislating to fight it and legislating about other things from the Homestead Act to creating, well, or at least laying the groundwork to create Yosemite National Park. And they're not sitting and thinking aloud in their letters as much as they did before the war for the logical reason that now they're governing. And a lot of things go on behind the scenes. But they're trying to win this war. And it is very hard to know what would have happened had Lincoln lived. Mm -hmm. I think I can safely say that it would have been a much different result. When he was assassinated, his successor, Andrew Johnson, was an out-and-out -out racist and had no desire to listen to Frederick Douglass or any radical Republican about anything. Lincoln was clearly looking for a middle ground throughout the war, and he would have continued trying to find one. But the quotation you have, there's another one, where in the second inaugural address, which I like to say for my money is his best speech that we know of. Because apparently there was one speech he once gave that people said was so good nobody took notes. And so they don't know what he said. Uh, but he refers to that how slavery was somehow the cause of the war. And the somehow does not suggest that he's uncertain whether it was the cause, but that in different ways, the people who viewed it as a moral issue, the people who viewed it as an economic issue, constitutional issue, and so on. And that he said before with malice toward none, with charity for all, that if God wills that this war continue until we have made up for the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil and every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be replaced by another drawn with the sword then shall it be said that the judgments of the lord are true and righteous altogether and by this time grant appears to be beating the south into submission at least militarily uh, lincoln's been re-elected and as we know, politicians who are running for re-election sometimes sound different after they've been re-elected. And on April 11th, 1865, he advocated limited black suffrage, which he had never really done before to that degree. And one of the people who heard him make the speech was John Wilkes Booth. And that is the moment that Booth decided to kill him. So there is pushback. And Lincoln himself is pushing back in certain ways. And it's just hard to know between having to concentrate on the war itself and what he never got to do that we, we can't really know for sure. And heaven knows I wish we did. And, and I think for all of his faults, and he had them, that his death was a great tragedy in ways that I think we are still paying for. Uh, I think in any conversations about Lincoln, emancipation, the, the Civil War, we always come down to that question of uh, what was the true reason for the Civil War? And uh, I always ask it because I think that it's always something that bears reiteration and, and reminding, especially to those who uh, make the, those state rights or just cause arguments. Um, so there's an article from We're History, 
uh, and it notes that the decision to sign the Compensated Emancipation Act was deliberately symbolic in positioning the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Uh, as a juxtaposition to Richmond, Virginia as the seat of the Confederacy. Um, and, and Lincoln is making these statements about uh, slavery is the bone that we are all fighting over and, and those sorts of remarks. So despite the, the state's rights uh, argument, despite the just cause arguments we often hear, what does this tell us about the true reason or the true reasons for the Civil War? It tells us that the South went to war to protect slavery and by the way, managed to destroy slavery by going to war. If they had not seceded, slavery would have survived longer. How long? I don't know. We can't know. And I shudder to think. But a few years back, when it was the 150th anniversary of the war, I was at the Organization of American Historians Conference, which is our big U.S. history conference, and a very distinguished historian named Michael Holt was moderating a panel. And the panel was about the causes of the Civil War. And you had somebody arguing for the moral argument, you had somebody arguing for the economic argument. So in fact, I give an assignment uh, that I got from a colleague and friend named Deanna Beachley, who's a Northern Arizona University PhD, no Flagstaff. And uh, it lists, it asks students to rate 10 causes of the Civil War. And the whole point is they are inseparable. Everything from belief in the Union to slavery itself to economics, and it all, you, you cannot take the 10 apart. They all go together. But slavery is at the center of it, pure and simple. Well, Holt asked this question at the end of this. He said, my first question is, what caused the Civil War? And everybody burst out laughing because they just spent an hour discussing what caused the Civil War. And then Holt said, the cause of the Civil War was secession. What caused secession? And I thought, well, that's why he's a big professor in Virginia, and I'm where I am doing what I do. But, but the fact is, the South seceded because Lincoln became president. What made them so nervous about Lincoln being president? Don't tell me it was tariffs. They were all divided about tariffs. Don't tell me that it was you know, all patronage appointments. He wasn't going to send people from Vermont into South Carolina to try to run things. It was that the South knew that he was not going to tolerate the expansion of slavery. And I use the analogy with students of a plant that is in a pot and its roots outgrow the pot. Mm -hmm. What do you do? You repot it. What if you don't? It's strangled. It dies. And as far as the South was concerned, they needed to repot. And if they didn't do that, slavery would ultimately die. And a kind of weird way to look at it is three quarters of the states need to approve a constitutional amendment. The 11 Confederate states are now fewer than three quarters of the United States, or fewer than a quarter of the United States. Three quarters would presumably be in the end. Well, gee, does that tell us anything? Uh, the South did secede to protect slavery. And Lincoln and his top advisors, what are the leaders do it? One of the most interesting things that I was reading about the, uh, the Compensated Emancipation Act um, was saying that it, it was an interesting and maybe unforeseen impact of the act was the requirement for slave owners to petition the government in writing for that compensation. Um, and why it's seen as, as a really unique benefit of that act um, is that it created a unique historical record of enslaved persons that to that point have remained largely anonymous uh, because of the hesitancy of, of slave owners to document uh, uh, their human property. Um, so 
first of all, are these records um, available and searchable? And if so, how can they or how could they, if they're not, um, help us to gain a better understanding of the lives of the enslaved, the realities of slavery and, and so forth in our nation? I believe they are available through the National Archives. And, you know, the history of enslaved people is in some ways incredibly difficult to write because you don't have the easily available sources. You don't have the letters that are contemporaneous. But then again, it also means it gives you a challenge of how to reconstruct these lives. And historians have pleasantly found ways. And this is an example where if you know that this person was the enslaver of this person, you can look up both of them, look for records of both of them, be it in the census or in directories, what have you, and try to figure out what they were all doing. And uh, we are gathered tonight, uh, to the thanks to the original efforts of really the father of black history as we know it, Carter Woodson who really started what was then called Negro History Week. And there's been a revolution in the profession I chose, where once upon a time, I like to say, I don't like saying it, but I like to describe it this way, that it was the history of rich white men taught to rich white men written by rich white men. And with the increased diversity of historians, there's been more awareness of sources like these, and then using still other sources to get as close to the truth as we can get. Mm -hmm. And there may be absolute truth, but it's very hard to find. Let's face it. Mm -hmm. So this is a good basis for us. And I mean, I have a friend who is working on a history of the Freedmen's Bureau. Mm -hmm. And he is taking the records and listing every free person he can find in the Bureau of Records and then saying, all right, newspapers, censuses, city directories. All right, then we know they were in this area. Who was enslaving people in this area? And work backward and forward. Uh, so if you think of history as a jigsaw puzzle, which it is, or as a cold case, which it is, or sometimes it's a hot case. Uh, you're a detective. And this is a wonderful set of clues to have. I want to uh, jump to some uh, audience questions um, that I just saw have come in. Uh, one of the questions was, do you think Lincoln was so naive as to think that getting rid of slavery would change people's attitudes about enslaved people? So when the 13th Amendment passed, Lincoln gave a little speech and he said, this is a king's cure for all the evils. And he really believed you've ended the institution. Now everything will ultimately be okay. Now I look at that and you look at that. And I'm by you, I mean, not just you, but people watching this and say, what? How could he possibly have thought this? And then I was reading a wonderful book called Simple Justice about the decision in Brown v. Board of Education. And almost the same thing was said about the issue of segregation by Thurgood Marshall. Mm -hmm. And I think part of this is that people who are willing to fight these battles often do so believing in what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. And that people will see these things once they really get the opportunity to see them. And you can go back in philosophy to all kinds of views of human nature, but they are, I guess, like the fishermen, the eternal optimist. And 
would Lincoln have been disappointed? Absolutely. And then he would have said, well, all right, now we move this piece among around the chessboard to make it work this way, and I'll back over here and go forward here and so on. And ultimately, as we saw, Thurgood Marshall was an ardent defender of integration and busing and, and other things designed to make what he intended in the Brown decision to be reality. So I say all that just to show Lincoln's not unique in this naivete. Uh, another question from the audience was, why do you think people are so hesitant to acknowledge and talk about these issues? I'm going to use myself. When I was growing up, my grandfather lived with us, or we lived with him, however you want to put it. And my grandfather had been a lifelong policeman way before Miranda. And when I was a cheeky kid, one night he was watching TV and there was some story about crime, and he said, as he often would, mm, not the same since Miranda. And I said, Grandpa, from the stories you told me, I think you caused Miranda. And he sort of chuckled a little and said, yeah, you may be right. Well, he'd tell stories about beating confessions out of people. And I can look at the police and see his bad side and his good side. These issues show, the, in many cases, the worst side of Americans, of human beings. That's difficult for a lot of people. Uh, I'm my biggest critic, so I, I may, I don't think I have less of a problem, but I may have less of a problem because I'm always looking at myself saying, oh God, how did you screw that up? Uh, but, but it's hard for a lot of people to look at this and say, gee, my grandfather was this way, or I am descended from people who enslaved other people. And uh, yeah, there are political issues where who's voting for whom. Uh, and that certainly comes into play. But it also can be a very difficult thing to acknowledge about people we love, including if we love ourselves, ourselves and our failings. And I look at my life and say, not so much that I did things that I regret on this issue, but there are things I didn't do that I regret that I did not do. And I think that's part of it. Uh, by the way, I, it's a story that is not politically correct, but I tell it with great affection. I had a wonderful student years ago, a woman named Renee, who was African-American. And I was talking about the Civil War and Reconstruction. And I referred to the idea, which Mattias Stevens endorsed, of 40 acres and a mule. Which, by the way, in some ways was limiting because there were many African Americans in the cities, or Americans who had no desire for 40 acres and a mule, but wanted a different kind of job. And Renee said, yeah, I never got 40 acres and a mule. And I said, Renee, you're from Boston. What would you have done with 40 acres and a mule? And she laughed, and we all laughed. And at the end of class, she came down and she said something that was not completely correct, but that unfortunately there was some correctness to it. She said, you know, you're the only professor of mine who will talk about race. Mm -hmm. And she was a sociology major. Mm -hmm. I said, if you're scared, go home. Tenure is a lovely thing. I have tenure. There are certain things I can talk about in class that if they're controversial, I won't get in trouble. There are other people who can get in trouble. The lieutenant governor of Texas now wants to eliminate tenure for faculty, uh, which is a way to control speech, pure and simple. But it can be a very hard thing to discuss, and people get very understandably emotional about it, have strong feelings about it. And if you don't like to watch a confrontation, it can be something you want to avoid. Uh, my last question. Uh, and to, to close us out is uh, you mentioned uh, the April 16th uh, Emancipation Day. 
Um, at the time, it, it became hugely symbolic and, and celebratory to Black Washingtonians, uh, and it actually remained an, an annual public celebration until 1901. Um, I believe it died off at that point, but it, it was reinvigorated to some extent in, I think it was 1991 or around that time frame. Um, so two questions here, really. One, why do you think in comparison to events like Juneteenth, um, April 16th as Emancipation Day has not remained a well-known or widely celebrated holiday uh, or Memorial Day? And two, do we think it should be? Is it one that is worth uh, bringing back and, and reminding folks of as one of our holidays? The easy part is the second one, yes. Uh, this is the first time the United States government took a strong stand for emancipation. You can say, oh, yes, passing the, the law against the international slave trade is at least a stand. Uh, but frankly, no, this is emancipation itself, and it deserves to be celebrated. As for the why, ending in 1901, this is not long after the events in Wilmington, North Carolina, where essentially white people killed black people and overthrew the government. And this is as Jim Crow is developing. It's not long after the Plessy decision. And Washington, D.C. was a government town of white people with a significant African-American population. And I think all of that enters into it. And with Washington, D.C. getting what's called home rule, though it doesn't have it fully, in the late 1960s, uh, you begin to see a greater appreciation for that part of its history. And I think that this has helped with the comeback there in D.C. of the commemoration of Emancipation Day. At the same time, I would say the day to celebrate may actually be the day the 13th Amendment took effect, because once it's in the Constitution, it's very hard to get out of the Constitution. And uh, December, I think it's December 6th, see, I'm, I'm not entirely certain of the date, but December 6th, 1865, it gets to the three quarters of the states ratifying it. We don't really commemorate that day. But I'm glad we have the commemorations to remind us of the importance of emancipation. And there are other dates, January 1st, uh, where we can indeed celebrate the right thing happening, as painful as it was to get there. Absolutely. Uh, that's a wonderful spot for us to wrap up tonight's conversation and say, uh, as always, thank you. Thank you for joining us and thank you for uh, just a, a beautiful presentation, well, insightful and, and engaging and very interesting, a lot of new learning and uh, just a new way to look at, at some of this history. So we are always grateful for your presence and participation. Um, Thank you very much for asking. Absolutely. I'm honored to have been asked. Uh, we also always say uh, thank you to our uh, audience for joining us. Thank um, you all. There is a, a comment from uh, actually my dad. I was going to say just a, an audience member, but it's my dad. <laughs> Hi, uh, dad. During a, a proverb that says, love truth even if it hurts you, hate lies even if they help you. We flip this around. Um, this is uh, our opportunity to flip it back and, and make sure that we're approaching history uh, in the right ways and, and learning from our past in ways that ensure that we don't repeat it and we, we do better going forward. Um, so we say thank you, as always, to those joining us. Uh, we invite you to join us next time. We'll be back on Thursday, February 4, uh, 24th for a presentation on the Black Panther movie and its cultural significance. Mm. Uh, we'll also be back on Monday, February 28th with a, with a presentation on the assassination of Fred Hampton. Um, so we invite you to join us through the remainder of this month. Keep learning, engaging with us. Uh, and as always, we thank you, we wish you well, and we hope that you go in grace. <laughs>